Dr. Stephen Austin, who is Professor of Cellular and Structural Biology at the University of Texas, San Antonio, here to talk about evolutionary medicine and aging. Uh, thank you. I, I feel it incumbent to say that after hearing about death and disease and disability and disorders all day, that we need to remember that we're now living longer and staying healthy longer than at any point in human history, which of course means that a whole lot of things that are happening to us now are going to be the consequence of aging which is why I call it the emperor of all maladies. I stole that, of course, from Dr. Mukherjee, who called cancer the emperor of all maladies, uh, but he was wrong about that. Across the top, you see uh, the six leading causes of death in the US today. Across the bottom, you see the six leading causes of disability. The important thing is for uh, 11 of those 12 things, the key factor involved in their development is aging. This makes it very nice for people like me because I can say I'm doing the most important biomedical research in the world. And if we can do something about slowing aging, we can simultaneously improve all of these things. Now, when I say that aging is the number one implicator in all of those things, I think that underestimates how important it is. So let me try to present this in a vivid way for people. Here are some of the major risk factors for heart disease that we know about. These are well described. If you put those in the context of aging and say, how much does a percent increase of these risk factors compared to aging, you can see that it completely dwarfs all those things. So all of the money that we've put into these other things, if we put that money into combating aging, just look at the effect we could potentially have. Uh, similarly, and I could do this for disease after disease after disease, but I, uh, uh, heart disease and Alzheimer's disease, here are the major risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And when you put in aging, you see can't even see those risk factors anymore except for the APOE genotypes. So having made that case, what I'm going to do today, when I, when I talk about an evolutionary perspective, I, what I tell is that every molecular biologist, no matter how divorced you think your researcher your research is from evolution, you need to have an evolutionary perspective and for at least four reasons that I call selection thinking, diversity thinking, uh, phylogenetically thinking, and, and environmental thinking. It's environmental thinking that I'm going to talk about today because I think one of the most interesting things going on now is how we're beginning to think about what's been known for 70 years, which is that chronic dietary restriction in laboratory animals extends life and it's it's very well established you see in the lower right there survival curves of restricted and control animals and what you see at the bottom is the filled circles are ages at which cancers killed the uh, control animals and the ages at which cancers killed the dietary restricted animals now that phenomenon by the way it doesn't just extend life. It also improves health in just about every way. You can measure it. If you put a running wheel in the cage, you can see that the uh, rats in this case that were getting an ad lib diet didn't run much to begin with and quickly stopped. Yet the restricted animals were running uh, kilometers a night even after the last ad lib rat had died. So we've studied this for 70 years. We know that virtually every way we can measure health in a laboratory rodent, it's improved by a dietary restriction. Now, aging researchers leapt to an evolutionary explanation of this. And I think they leapt to the wrong exp uh, evolutionary explanation. And I think by doing so, they've missed an enormous implication of this work. And so I'd like to tell you what the uh, traditional explanation is, why I think it's wrong, what a better explanation is, and some implications for that. And then finally, I'd like to tell you about why I think we can mimic this pharmacologically and really have a large impact on aging. So here's the uh, prevailing orthodoxy that dietary restriction is advantageous in an evolutionary sense because animals experience food shortages. And particularly rodents that we know the most about 
experience food shortages and that this is a way to throw them into a survival mode so that they can survive long enough so that instead of their reproduction being completely depleted by the time food becomes abundant again, in fact, when food becomes abundant again, reproduction can start again. And we know this is true to the extent that if you put a, a mouse or a rat on dietary restriction and you keep it alive to the age long past the ad lib animals have been able to reproduce, and then you start refeeding it again, they reproduce just fine. So that's the scenario, that it's, this, that it's a chronic advantage because of a reasonably long-term food shortage. But when you think about it in nature, this doesn't really make sense. And this is why I think that it's dangerous for laboratory scientists to think about nature, because they don't know very much about it by and large. So one of the things is it, it preserves many physiological systems but if you actually know how long a rat or a mouse lives in nature, it preserves them long past the time that they're ever alive in nature. In fact, the big physiological declines that we see in rats and mice in the lab are not apparent in nature because they don't live long enough. But also, let's imagine that you had designed a process, a survival phase that animals could stay in for months until food came back. You would expect that it would be adaptive in many senses, but we know that chronic dietary restriction enhances cold sensitivity. Death by cold is probably the number one killer of mice in the wild. We know it reduces sprint speed. The ability to run away from a predator is important even if cold isn't. We know it slows wound healing and animals in the wild are wounded all the time and the longer you have an open wound, the more exposed to potential infection you are. And if you get infected, we know that dietary restriction, at least for a number of important infectious agents, such as flu, is more like, those animals are more likely to die. So for all of those reasons, I think this idea that chronic dietary restriction is really the answer to why this huge physiological shift that occurs with dietary restriction has evolved uh, is, is, is misguided. But there's a less appreciated observation, and I think that this may hold the key to understanding the evolutionary origin of what I call the dietary restriction effect. That is a massive increase in a number of protective mechanisms. So the focus has always been on dietary restriction improving, extending life and improving this physical capacity, but it also protects against many toxins, and we know this so well because for many years, the National Institute on Aging kept a huge colony of dietary restricted mice and rats at the National Center for Toxicological Research. And they tried giving them everything. Let's see what happens if we give uh, this carcinogen, that carcinogen, and always the dietary restricted animals uh, survived better. But it wasn't just carcinogens, it was cardiotoxic agents, it was hematotoxic agents. It was uh, things like aspirin that can cause gastric mucosal injury, hepatotoxicity. I could go on and on and on. A much more robust finding even than dietary restriction extends life is that it protects against a wide variety of uh, toxins. So here is, here's a different hypothesis, that the DR effect evolved to help animals survive an acute food shortage. After all, for an animal the size of a mouse or a rat, long-term food shortage, being in negative energy balance, is a very short-term operation in the wild. If you're in negative energy balance for very long, you're a dead animal. Now, what happens when there's an acute food shortage? If animals want to continue reproducing, and if you're likely to uh, uh, be killed by cold or the predator in the near future, then you want to reproduce as quickly as possible, you will broaden your diet. You will eat food items that you didn't eat previously. You will eat food items that have been uh, contaminated or infected that have bacteria or fungi growing on them. And the idea is that these sorts of acute food shortages will lead to a broadening of the diet Animals will broaden the diet to keep the positive energy balance so they can reproduce. That will expose them to new toxins. And therefore, dietary restriction arose as this defense, an acute defense, against a whole variety of toxins. Now, if that's true, 
then that means that there ought to be significant acute advantages to dietary restriction, not just chronic advantages. After all we know, let's imagine that this were proved that reducing your caloric intake by 25 or 30 percent in people would make you live a longer, healthier life. Well, we just heard that, you know, uh, we know that's not going to happen. Um, there are some people that are trying to do that, but we know that's not going to happen. But what if there were advantages to acute dietary restriction? We also call that fasting. Therefore, there could be acute effects that are unrelated to life extension. And I'm going to mention two cases where people ha have tried this out and have found remarkable results, results that have clinical significance that would probably have never been discovered if we'd only focused on dietary restriction. The first is some work by Jay Mitchell, who looked at renal ischemia reperfusion injury as a consequence of surgery. So as the non-medical uh, people in the audience may or may not know, when you cut off blood supply or oxygen to a tissue, that does a certain amount of damage, but the real damage is done with the reperfusion when the blood floods back and all kinds of hell breaks loose. What Jay did was he said, what would happen if I did this ischemia reperfusion surgery and I did it on animals that are ad lib, and as you can see here, the ones that are ad lib, 90% of them were dead by four days after. If I did them that animals that had been on chronically dietary restriction for a month or on a one or a two or a three day fast. And what he found was that the one or the two or the three-day fast was virtually as effective at preventing uh, ischemia reperfusion injury as a long-term fast. In fact, he also measured uh, damage to the kidney. It was very nice. He also did this in a genotype of mouse that does not live longer when you give it chronic caloric restriction. So to me, there's something potentially, there, there, there's something really important here, uh, potentially, and I've been hoping uh, that the surgical world would look into this with a little more um, uh, energy than has happened so far. I asked Jay, I said, have a lot of places approached you about talking to you about doing a clinical trial on something like this? And he told me, no. The other interesting thing that came out of the idea of thinking about an evolutionary scenario where dietary restriction provides a an acute survival advantage is that Walter Longo from uh, USC, thought, who studied this for a long time in yeast of all things, finally thought that an acute dietary restriction might actually reduce uh, chemotoxicity of chemotherapeutic drugs. And so he took these three different genotypes of mice, fasted them for two days, and then gave them a massive dose of etoposide. And you can see all the red lines there are the ones that had been fasted for two days, and you can see that none of them died. And the other lines are those that had been fully fed, and you can see that a proportion of those died. So a point becomes, if, if, if either acute or chronic caloric restriction can le lead to increased protection against toxins, can lead to increased health, increased life, is there a way we can pharmacologically mimic that? And so what we've been doing at my place for the last uh, few years is studying a drug called uh, rapamycin, which many of you clinicians no doubt have used. So let me just tell you about this study. This is here, some of the people that started this. Dave Sharp on the left there, this was his idea. The idea was that this drug, which is basically originally isolated from uh, a bacterium found on Easter Island, Rapa Nui in the local language, thus rapamycin, um, they decided to give this chronically uh, to mice. Dave thought that because of this complex where stress resistance feed in, feeds into what's called the mTOR pathway, food availability feeds into the mTOR pathway, that this integrated many aspects of the same things that food restriction would integrate. So they started this study, and what they found was that the mice lived longer, but that was sort of the, the small part of the finding. Science Magazine, by the way, selected this as one of the 10 scientific breakthroughs of 2009. And here's the most remarkable thing about it. It was begun at 20 months of age. So that's a mouse equivalent of 60. So think about it. <clears throat> if they had asked me to 
whether they should do this, by the way. I would have said, don't waste your time. If you start any therapy of any sort at that age in a mouse, there's no chance that you will make it live longer. <clears throat> Fortunately, they didn't ask me. They did it. The mice were fed rapamycin daily in the food. This, by the way, was the best kind of scientific serendipity. They didn't mean to start it that late. They had a difficult time figuring out how to get it in the food, how to make it stable in the food. And while they were figuring that out, the mouse, mice they had set aside were getting older and older and older. So once they dis ignored my advice, they started this experiment, they found that from the time they gave the mice the food, the mice lived about 33% longer. Now, there's longevity studies all the time that I'm highly skeptical about. And I'm highly skeptical about them, not because I think they're bad, but because I don't believe anything until it's repeated independently. The nice thing about this study was it was done at three sites independently at the same time. All sites reached the same conclusion. So it had instant credibility and a great comfort to those of us who were uh, about 20 months old in mouse equivalents. Now, some other people at my institution saw these results start to come in, and they said, wait, if this is really addressing aging, and aging is really influencing all kinds of other pathologies, maybe this will also be effective against individual diseases. So, the, again, this was two studies, completely independent of one another, except for the fact that they were both at my institution. They used two different mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> They began the rapamycin at different ages. They continued it for different lengths of time. But when they then tested their mice cognitively, they found substantial cognitive benefits in both cases. <clears throat> Moreover, when they looked at A-beta, <clears throat> what's thought to be the key player in uh, Alzheimer's disease, they found reduced A-beta in both cases. And here's just <clears throat> what the antibodies look like in the control case here. This is the uh, hippocampus with lots of A-beta in the control case, lots of, or lots less in the rapamycin case. Now, what else? So we followed up on this. And most of the study is either published or it's submitted. In older mice, in mice that are getting it from about the age of 19 or 20 months, rapamycin protects against mouse models of atherosclerosis, protects against several types of cancer. It's used as an immunosuppressant in the clinic. So it's very surprising to find out that this chronic administration in the food actually improved response to flu vaccine. It provided provides better sleep consolidation in older mice. It also protects against pneumococcal pneumonia. Again, a huge surprise given that its reputation is as an immunosuppressant, main, tr maintains stride length into older age, pr improve, uh, preserves spatial memory, even in non-Alzheimer's mice, and preserves balance and coordination. So trying to hurry through all of this, I kind of forgot about evolution. Let's go back to evolution. Because we understand evolutionary biologist George Williams that Randy talked about earlier really made a huge contribution to the biology of aging in the 1950s when he decided that basically aging was a trade-off, that the design that you need to make a healthy, young, vigorous, reproductive animal has long-term consequences, has long-term deteriorative, degenerative effects on health. A corollary of that, if that's true, and there's now overwhelming evidence that that is in fact the case, corollary of that is this: you find ways to improve later life health, it's gonna have early life consequences that aren't good. And in fact, if you give rapamycin to a mouse that's pregnant, the embryos don't survive. If you give rapamycin to a young growing mouse, it retards its growth, it inhibits its reproduction. But what we know now is if you wait until you have a 60 year old mouse and start giving it then, there appear to be multiple health benefits. <clears throat> and what this provides is a proof of principle that it seems to be possible to uh, really slow the aging in a mammal. So in conclusion, acute fasting may have numerous unexpected health benefits. 
pharmacological memory of important aspects of chronic DR are possible. Such therapies are likely to have early detrimental effects, but these therapies may be able to be started later in life than anyone expected. I will close there. <laughs>